Hello and welcome to another Album of Record podcast. I'm Craig Lindell, joined as always by Andrew. How is it going, Andrew? Well, you know, we're recording this on Election Day, so uh, when people listen to this, we might know who our president is, although it's not clear that we will know by Friday. But uh, yeah, feeling the uh, nervous energy of the day for sure. Um, but, yeah, man, this, uh, this podcast tonight is our reprieve from paying attention to the details that, like, the, the news isn't going to come in. Um, and, you know, you and I don't specifically talk about politics, but I think it's fair to say that, like, whether whether it's the trade deadline of a professional sports league or it's waiting for the votes to be counted in an election, I've given up on kind of that iterative reporting style where like like just tell me tell me when it's done like when the decision is over you know the all the speculation of trade deadline day in uh, the NBA or the uh, not the NFL as much but even yeah. anymore even the NFL it's like I don't want to suffer the ups and downs before I don't want to worry about something before it happens just I want to deal with whatever it is when we know what it actually is and presidential elections have become torturous because the counting and the days like you would have thought the Bush Gore, you know, hanging chads recount thing was kind of a one off. But now it feels like every one of our presidential elections are three, four day uh, dilemmas. Yeah, I think the uh, Bush Gore election really is sort of the defining moment that led us to where we're at in the American political system today. I think a lot of it really stems from that happening. Uh, And, you know, like Bush's reelection wasn't particularly close. I don't recall, Um, you know, Obama's elections. We knew on election night, but both of those, you know, that he would won. Uh, So it does kind of differ a little bit from that. But I think that, you know, growing up, and we won't dive too deep into the politics of this, but just to say that growing up, you when we had our elections, we certainly had our preference. You know, one got one person might have a little bit more aligned policies or ideas that we thought were good, but for the most part, it was like, well, you know, the difference between the two candidates didn't seem that dramatic you know it was ultimately yeah things will mostly be the same either way if you know uh you know maybe a few tax cuts here and there or you know a few social policies might be different here or there but for the most part they didn't seem that different and as we've become more polarized our candidates are also there therefore getting further and further to each polar opposite um, I think a lot of that has to do with our primary system. I think our primary system is not healthy for us. Uh, you know, you're you, going too far, buddy. <laughs> well, you know, I just think on the, you know, take give the context for why we've gotten to this point that now election coverage feels torturous because now it does feel like there's a pretty stark difference between the candidates, and you know, I think it can really give. I mean, we've seen both sides say it. You know the Republicans or the Democrats have certainly cast, you know, this idea of what what will happen to America if Donald Trump becomes president again. But heck, you know, we just saw Elon Musk on uh, the Joe Rogan podcast saying that if Kamala wins the election, that you know we'll never have another election again. That this is this will be the end of free and fair elections in this country. So both sides are sort of raising those stakes and you just get all this coverage and it just makes it a lot less fun. You know, I used to love election day. I used to watch all, like as soon as I got home, I would turn on the news and just start watching the coverage because I thought it was interesting to see exit polls and to see how, you know, how the demographic shifts actually played out versus what the polling was ahead of time. There was all these like really interesting things, but now it's like just this existential dread, no matter which side, which side you're on, which person you support. I think there's a feeling of dread almost uh, to the outcome well, of this I think election. that's part of it, but I think part of it too is our our social media environment where we think that just because we're spending time talking about something that we can figure out what's going to happen, 
you know, yeah. the, our obsession with the polls to try and predict the future. Cause we just, you know, our anticipation, we can't handle our anticipation and we just want to know how it ends. Yeah. And the, we're used to getting our instant gratification, uh, somehow, some way and, and yeah. getting the, the, the buzz in our brains when, when we want it, as opposed to, you know, when something's finished. And so I, I think it's our impatience too. you know, we're, we're very much constantly trying to entertain ourselves and trying to, to get our, our, to the, the, um, the pleasure centers of our brain. We're trying to feed it all the time. Yeah. And when we're in a scenario where we don't control that and we can't just play another game of Candy Crush or watch a, a another episode of of Ted Lasso or something on Netflix to to give us that, um, you know, it's contrary to the way we currently live our lives. Yeah, and as with not just social media, but just the way the internet is in general and technology, you know, we live in the era of big data. And we have so many more data points today leading up to the election where, you know, again, when we were, you and I were growing up, you still had polls, but it was just a handful of polls. And you would just kind of like see the different polls and you would just kind of take it at face value. And that would be that. Whereas now there's an entire industry of t collecting every poll in existence trying to apply analytics to it and weighting different polls and trying to come up with some formula that says this is where we're at. And you can really get into that minutia where it, it, again, it just becomes an everyday thing leading up to the election of trying to understand who has the momentum. You know, it's kind of like, in, in a lot of ways, like I always laugh when you talk about like, or when you're have like a draft in one of the sports, you know, in the NFL, people say, Oh, this quarterback is moving up the, the, the draft charts, you know, Oh, there's a lot of momentum for this guy. It's like, but what does that really mean? How can you actually have momentum? Because until we have drafted, there is no draft board. There is no. And we've talked about this a million times over the years, you know, once they go through the combine and once all their tape is on is done in college and they've played their final snap in college, yeah. or, you know, and I'm talking NFL, of course, right. Uh, it's a static thing unless, unless a guy gets popped for DUI or gets arrested or some other intervening factor there's the, or gets injured. There's no up or down. There's no momentum. It's locked in place and you just have to wait until the, the yep. team is on the clock and makes the pick. And, yep. and, America was on the clock today. And we just have to wait and figure out who who they decided to draft number yeah. one for president. Because I think that like that this idea that there are twenty percent of the electorate is wildly swinging one way or the other just doesn't seem realistic to me. I we just don't know is, what they want. I think this has essentially been a pretty close to fifty fifty race the entire time, and the polling samples really just depends on who they sample. And or then, it's not a 50 50 we just don't know anything which, yeah which is also entirely <laughs> possible but but even like it could be 50 50 but like could if, be if five percent of one party is more likely to go vote today than the other if it just turns out because of the way uh you know the which side shows up to vote that could swing it and it could look like a huge disparity when really it was just a matter of but you, you know, know what election you know what? turnout it's funny because they have collected all this data and it's 50 50, you know, or how else it would be 50 50 if we didn't collect any data at all. Yeah, that's that's and right. It's like, oh, there's two candidates. That sounds like a coin flip. And so, yeah, like, maybe we shouldn't we collect all this data at all. Yeah. You know, like, I wonder, like, truly, you know, we I, really didn't plan on talking about the election. We really long. did it. We've gone a lot further into the politics than I expected. But, like, I'm always, like, interested by this. Uh, like, is is a, like just because of our two party system, are we inherently required to pretty much always be within the margin of error of 50 50? Like, <laughs> is there ever is there really a, any event that could happen that would swing 60 percent of our country to one political party and make a true you know one party rule system i you know i to me i just have a hard time envisioning that like well, when we when we launch the political podcast it's going to be called the margin of error 
And yep. it's going to be it's going to be a lot of this wishy washy, non committal, non partisan. Like, yeah. hey, isn't this whole process kind of goofy? Isn't this weird? <laughs> yeah, I that, absolutely. So we have um, we have a l- couple different topics. I think we're going to probably just try to roll through here today. But since we are talking about politics, I am kind of curious to get your opinion on the effect of this election either way in the next four years on music. Do you think one, one of these candidates winning will impact music more than the other? Will, will there be a reaction to it? I'm just kind of curious if you have a sense of, of, of that or any thoughts on that. I've given up on that. Um, I used to, I used to, it was a little bit crass, but I used to project really good albums off of my favorite artists when they, when I know they went through a divorce or a breakup. Um, I, I always presumed that, um, again, non, non nonpartisan here, but it's, it's no, it's no secret that a lot of the artists that we love are not big Trump supporters. I kind of assumed that, the the Trump administ the first Trump administration would unleash a torrent of wonderful records and I, I don't really feel like there was a correlation there and then yeah. during the pandemic I thought the pandemic and all the time that people spent at home might lead to some kind of an awakening of the arts in terms of music and I think we've had some really great records come out but it's hard to tie any of it back to the pandemic itself um, if anything I think. Uh, the only correlation you and I have been able to make between music and the pandemic was us maybe overrating stuff because we needed it so badly. Yeah, th- and that's true. And maybe a similar phenomenon could happen regardless of which candidate wins that, you know, if if people are feeling a certain way in general in society, that maybe there will be some albums that like particularly speak to somebody and how they're feeling on that political environment. Um, you know, or else maybe who knows if Trump wins, maybe uh, Kid Rock and Ted Nugent will be emboldened for a split, a split EP or something. You know, you don't get... you think Kid Rock is about as emboldened as he's ever going to be already? <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah, that guy's, doing, I mean... that guy's doing great. He's loving his life. <laughs> you know, the the funny thing is, is you know, here comes our uh, Pearl Jam segment. Uh, but you know, I think the the funny thing for me with that is, you know, this idea that of Pearl Jam be, you know having the their political ideals and like i remember like in the bush administration it really seemed like there there was a lot of songs that were a reaction to that and the thing that i thought was interesting and maybe this is just a factor of pearl jam not releasing albums very quickly anymore but like we didn't get a pearl jam album inside of the trump administration you know gigaton came out i'm pretty sure after uh, oh, whatever close to or, the tail end yeah and obviously some of that was written when he was there but he, but even gigaton really didn't have much reactions the song seven o'clock has a, a, a lyrics about about trump you know but um quick escape has a, a spe- actually mentions trump by name but you know i didn't feel to your point like i just didn't feel like there were a lot of like protest albums like I can't think of like a singular like protest album, the defining protest album of the Trump era. So I don't know that we would necessarily uh, see that happen again. Um, But, you know, not to get into, I'm not going to discuss, you know, the economic side of which person wins, but I think those shifts in economics could have an impact on, you know, Maybe not just not just what is written, but maybe even how certain industries work in general. But that stuff is way over my head to talk about. Uh, yeah. In this episode. Well, and I, I to to be honest, I think uh, you know a constant theme for us has been Ticketmaster in the ticketing industry. Um, you know that could be very different depending on which candidate wins. Um, you know we'll just we'll just have to see. But I think I think a lot of those connections are kind of tenuous at best um yeah at least as i i keep looking for them and i i try and draw straight lines between this and 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 the art and i rarely do i feel like there's a connection so but it's funny you know you mentioned pearl jam and their protest songs i think some of their protest songs have been some of the some of the most mediocre in their catalog Uh, agreed like uh, like if you're gonna write a protest song it better be damn good 
Yeah, I don't think Ed is particularly great at that aspect. I think uh, I've they're too on the nose this a lot. His best lyrics are when he writes sort of these ambiguous lyrics that anybody can apply to whatever's going on in their life. Uh, those songs always feel more personal and more powerful to me than when he's being really specific about an individual. So, um, and I, I, that's not just an Ed thing either. Like, again, like I'm even just trying to think of who you would even think of as a modern person that really articulates, you know, anti whatever candidate uh, really well, you know, like, you know, like I'm even thinking about like like I uh on Lincoln Park's Minute to Midnight Minutes to Midnight, like they had some stuff about that was clearly about Bush and I never thought any of that was really clever. I always thought it was more grating than anything. So I, I yeah, I just don't think there's a lot of people that can do it really well. Um and so maybe maybe it would be for the best if people don't try it. You know what's funny? Uh I was thinking about this today actually and Again, m music meets politics. I think maybe one of the best songs that came as a reaction to uh, a political situation might be Jimmy Eat World's Futures. What's the story on that one? Well, I mean, it was that record came out in 2003 and it was a reaction to George W. Not George. Yeah, George W. Yeah, Bush George and, w. And, and political disillusionment. Okay. Um, yeah. But it's like, it's a really good song. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, probably one of the more famous, that reminded me, probably one of the more famous ones is American Idiot. Um, no, that's true. I always forget about that one because I wasn't a big fan it, of the music on that record. It hasn't really held up. I, you know, I, I actually did like the music of that album when it came out. I, I listened to that so much that I sort of got sick of it. But like, but even then the lyrics, a lot of people really seem to like it or respond to it. But like, I didn't even think that those were all that great, you know? And so uh, it's, it's just tough to do when you're again, when you're just being so hyper specific, because you really have to be in the mood to want that sentiment uh, as you, as you're listening to those things. Although I gotta say, you know, that record Boulevard of Broken Dreams is kind of an un undeniable song in the canon of rock music. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I think you still to this day here, wake me up when September ends a lot. Um, you know, there are, I always Jesus forget about that one. Jesus too. of suburbia was a pretty, pretty cool song. Like there, there, there are some good stuff on there. It's just, you know, it, for what was at the time, probably the most iconic protest album of that era. Uh, I, I, I don't think it like has, I don't think it's like particularly has a lot of value to people listening to it today. I think, you know, the kids today, certainly, you know, a 16 year old kid today who listens to that album has no frame of reference for what, right. what that's even talking about. And, um, and it's, and it's funny too, because like a 16 year old kid today probably wouldn't even understand why they're supposed to be mad at George W. Bush anyways. Cause I mean, George <laughs> right. W. Bush seems like a liberal compared to, uh, compared to where, uh, a lot of that party has moved. So. What what about Hail to the Thief? I obviously that oh, yeah. is a, do you consider that one a political record? Like, like the the first? title clearly is. The title clearly but is But hang on a second. So when you listen to that record, does do you think about, oh, this is just a this is a radiohead record and it happens to be called Hail to the Thief, or do you think of it as like a political statement record? I think of it as a Radiohead album. Yeah, me too. I, just, I don't. I just the, do. The, like, the name is the name, but I don't really think of it as a political record. Yeah, like you know, two plus two equals five. Wolf at the door. Like these. They're there. These aren't, they're there. Like these aren't things that you're associating directly to a political reference. Um, and again, that's part of that is because, and maybe that's maybe that's Tom York actually doing it well because he, there is enough ambiguity in that album that you can sort of frame it around anything you want it to be about. Cause the title of the album certainly implies that they were going for a message oh, yeah. on it. Uh, and that might just be the, an example of somebody doing it well. Maybe he does it so well that we don't even realize uh, or think about uh, what it is that he's trying to really say with, with, with that album. But again, Tom York is also a guy, I think, at least for me anyways, I don't listen to him 
as a vocalist in the traditional sense. Like we've talked about this before. In many ways, Tom York is an addition. His voice is an additional instrument more so than a traditional singer. Yeah. Um, and, and I guess I'm reading here that like a, the, the lyrics were definitely a response to the election and the unfolding war on terror. And so, so there you go. It's just totally but, lost on me. <laughs> but the way he writes, um, you know, unless, unless he names that record that you, you could listen right. to that record a thousand times and not necessarily know what it's about. And I, th I actually think that's a virtue for Tom York and, and the way he writes Absolutely. lyrics. Absolutely. That, that's, that's kind of what I was saying about like Ed, like I like Ed's songs when he does that. And I think it's cool that, you know, Tom York is able to do, do that on a political sense and still have these songs, write them in a way that you can sort of get out of it what what it is you want or what you need out of that. So it's pretty cool. So yeah, I guess that's really the last time we're talking about hail to the thief. We're talking about futures. Both of those kind of came out in that 2000, that early two thousands timeframe. I think there was a lot more reaction musically and artistically to the Bush era than there was the Trump era. And I don't know off the top of my head why that is per se. Um, yeah. I think, I think some of it might be, I'm trying to think how to say this without like being too one-sided about this, but I think there was, again, it sort of boils back to this idea like, I think with Bush, there was this idea that he was a traditional president, and I think it was a little bit edgier to be anti-Bush than it was to be anti-Trump. I think that a lot of people had very strong visceral reactions to Trump, but it's it became it, it felt much more status quo to be anti-Trump than I think it did anti-Bush, at least. And well, maybe that's, and I maybe think, this is my age difference too. I don't know. You know, I was still, no, I think some of what you're saying is just factually true based on perception, because you remember hearing comedians and late night talk show hosts talking about how it was really hard to even write jokes about Donald Trump right? Um, because he, because he's a celebrity and he's a singular character and a singular yeah. human um, with, with, you know, he was in home alone for God's sake, <laughs> like, or yeah. uh, well, home alone too. Um, yeah. that, and, and so maybe he's just like the unicorn that you couldn't write about. Right. And I think, uh, and again, a lot of his style is just so like, we still don't know how to necessarily handle his st his political style. Um, I, that's why traditionally in debates, he's done very well because it's like, nobody knows how to handle his approach, you know, when you're so used to debating people that talk about politics in the same way that everybody does on a very policy oriented manner. And then suddenly you have this guy who's just like talking about people eating cats and dogs. And like, it's, it's like, how do you write a joke about that? Like that is the joke, right? Like it's, it's just, get, it's, it's a much trickier proposition, I think, to really figure out how to be edgy in a way to have any kind of artistic value to an anti-Trump uh, approach. I think that might be partially the difference. All right. Where else do we want to go, Andrew? Oh, well, maybe talk about a couple new albums that have come out. Um, I, uh, yeah, let's start with that. Uh, albums or EPs, I guess. Uh, the one I wanted to talk about first is this uh, new Ben Quad EP. Um, and Ben Quad is a band that I know very little about. I know so let me almost start nothing then. about them. Yeah, because uh, I didn't know anything about them either until they were on the Wax Bodega tour, which was probably my favorite tour of the entire year. Um, it was um, Ben Quad. My brain's not working. I got to look it up. Um, uh, Saturdays uh, at our Saturdays place? at your place. Carly your Cosgrove, place? arms length. Uh, and Ben, Ben Quad is this weird kind of, um, this weird kind of, uh, progressive emo progressive indie band, the way they noodle on the guitar, the way they, they play guitar is just unlike many things I've seen before in, in an indie rock band, probably since like minus the bear, but they're not like minus the bear. They're totally different than that. And then they, they put out this EP that is very much not emo. It is almost hardcore, uh, very, very heavy, almost like 
maybe even heavier than the foxing record. Yeah. Uh, well, do you know where they're where where are they from? Oklahoma. Oh, that's right. I did actually see that because I was thinking about like the fact that they they're from Oklahoma and Chat Pile is from Oklahoma. Like Oklahoma's got a little bit of a thing going on. Uh, but uh, so I was not familiar with them at all. Uh, but they just signed to Pure Noise, which is my favorite label right now. Uh, and so I get all kinds of email alerts. And uh, they uh, the first thing I actually heard from them was on the Pure Noise uh, cover album that they just put out, uh, Dead Formats Volume 3. Um, and I don't mm-hmm. remember now even what song it was they covered um, on that. But that kind of caught my attention. I was like, oh, this is kind of interesting. Uh, well, then... Uh, I, and I hope you're looking up what the song is. It's, oh, yeah. it's, 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 dr- it's driving me crazy. that I can't think of what it's called. It's not a popular song that I was actually familiar with the original, but anyways, uh, so pure noise then, you know, announces that they signed them and they put out this EP and uh, this EP just completely blew me away it is five songs in i think 11 minutes um it is just a blistering set of aggressive screamo music but the guitar playing is what just i mean these guys are playing guitar in a manner that sounds it's not as technical but it's reminiscent of tim henson from polyphia like some of the tones that they're doing like reminds me so much of things that uh that polyphia would do um and and tim tim henson in particular uh like and so like i'm talking like extreme virtuoso stuff like so to say call them progressive i think is really sort of spot on that it is a progressive approach music uh progressive rock approach to the screamo sound uh but the the vocal the vocalist again it's screamo music uh but the vocalist just nails it and these songs are really good and i've i've found myself like really wishing like so when i do my year-end list i never include eps it's just my sort of it's because you're an elitist my elitist approach to it. Um, <laughs> I'm a strict uh, in- interpretationist. I'm a constitutionalist. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so I, d- I never count EPs, but I was telling Craig earlier today, I said, if this was a full album, this would be an easy top five. Like it- it's, it's that impressive. So uh, have you, have you given it this m- much of a listen yet? Oh yeah. Um, I probably haven't listened to it as much as you have, but, uh, I mean at 11 minutes, I've definitely listened to it six or seven yeah. times, uh, yeah. by now. Um, and really what, what sticks out to me is just how much different it is than some of their other stuff. Um, by the way, they, they covered, um, Cinco de Mayo shit show. That's it. Yep. That, that was it. Which again, I was not familiar with the original, but the song and is it- awesome. And it says featuring Chris Freeman, who I think was the auxiliary drummer for Manchester Orchestra, if I'm thinking oh, correctly. Oh, interesting. Okay. The former. You know, he's not with the band anymore. But um, anyway, but no, this this record, uh, I was just shocked by it, to be honest, and in a good way. Um, I enjoyed okay. it very much. I'm not sure that they could do an entire record like this um when when they were playing on the tour live when when they went into the and i'm i'm going from memory i'm trying to remember all this stuff but i i vaguely remember them talking about yeah we're gonna try and pull off this screaming thing and they were kind of nervous about it and um screaming an entire song and i I think it pulled them out of their comfort zone very similar to what we were talking about with foxing just a few months later um and so it'll it's interesting that it corresponds with them signing to pure noise it it'll be interesting to see if that this is their new path or if mm-hmm. they just needed to get this out of their system well what's funny is i i'm so glad that you were able to give some more context cuz like i said i know nothing about this band other just this ep just completely blew me away and so i had no idea even that their older stuff doesn't sound like this i've not gone back and i think they they have several eps i think they only have one proper album i saw but i haven't even i haven't even listened to it yet i haven't gotten to it i've just been binging this uh ep over and over again so i I think that's kind of interesting then that this is actually uh 
a little bit of a vibe shift for them uh, going into the more pure screamo. Because this, I mean, there are not many, if any, clean vocals on this EP. Like, right. it's pretty much full full force aggression for 11 minutes. And yeah, uh, yeah it's just awesome. Like, I like anytime I need, like, I love using this as like a palate cleanser in between albums. Like if I'm listening to something before I want to dive into another full album, I'll just throw on this EP and just like blast through this in 11 minutes. Um, I think it's pretty great. I'm, I'm very excited to see, you know, I hope they've got an album coming out soon. I'd like to see, see what they do. And I, I think that being in the pure noise family is sort of interesting then. Um, yeah. And make no mistake. They did, they did some screaming, but I always felt like there was a it was a, a mix, a back and forth between the clean vocals and the screaming for accent. And yeah. then this one just feels like nothing but screaming. Yeah. Okay. So So yeah, But yeah, that's and, and I you know, maybe it's a good thing they leave you wanting more. We'll, is, we'll see what happens with the, with their is, next Is Ben thing. Quad a person in the band? I don't believe so. Okay. So it's just it's just a just a name. I think so, so but okay. I actually no. There's nobody named Ben Quad in the band. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, I you know usually when we talk about and by bands, the way the 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 um the virtuoso guitar player is Edgar, and this dude okay. Edgar is just a monster. Um, yeah. He's 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 the kind of guy like he's unassuming when you see him. I believe that he wore his guitar pretty high. Like he doesn't give a shit about yeah. like looking cool with the guitar. It's all about how functional he can be while he's blistering across the, the fretboard. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'd like to see them live just to see him play just to, cause I oh, mean, he's a beast. Yeah. Just, you want to, you want to stand five feet from him while he's playing. Yeah. It just, it, it blew me away. Like, I cannot say enough. Like, I really recommend this to you guys to check out this. Even if you don't like screaming vocals that much, just check out this guitar playing. Cause it's, it's really remarkable for a band like this to hear this style of playing. Like it's, it's really great. So, yeah. So that's Ben quad. Um, you can, you can check them out. Uh, I think the next one I want to talk about is one that I know you're not going to have much to say about, but I just wanted to talk about a little bit is, uh, fucked up, uh, just put out a surprise album <laughs> just this week. Uh, or well, last, last week on Friday, I think, um, the album called someday. And what's interesting about this is, so this band, this is a, they're called a hardcore band. They're called a punk band they sort of transcend all of that. They, they're not any of those things. They're, there's nothing really like them. Um, you know, they have the like growling vocals from, uh, Damien Abraham, which certainly is where they get the hardcore sound, but musically and sonically, like the, some of these, uh, arrangements that they put together are just, mind-blowing like they're not it's hard to call it punk when you have this intricate layering of just guitar sounds after guitar sounds after guitar sounds um impeccable drumming um you know it's uh, the production is always front of mind with this band they don't they traditionally would take a long time to do these albums they were perfectionists they would like worry about every last detail and what's interesting about this band is though suddenly uh, last year they put out this album, uh, one day, which, uh, as the album alludes to, uh, basically every person in the band had 24 hours to write and record their parts. And then it went on to the next person. They had 24 hours to write and record their parts. So each, so they put constraints on themselves and what came out of that was by far the most focused fucked up album that we've had. And it was really great. Well, then this year they put out an album called Another Day, in which they basically did the same thing again, only this time, um, I believe this time they might have done it a little bit more together as a band. I think it was less of trading off. It was more of recording together. Then they decided, well, that's not enough. They said, what if we decided to write, record and produce an album in 24 hours and live stream the entire process. 
And that's exactly what they did. They actually did a 24, it was a little bit longer than 24 hours it ended up being, but they basically in a 24 hour live stream made an album. Um, it's called Who's Got the Time and a Half, I think. Um, yep. And it's way better than it has any right to be. Like, it is not an album that probably a lot of people are going to listen to a ton because it is rough. Like, when you put it, when you make an album in 24 hours like that, like it's really hard to make it sound like a totally complete album, it, but it's so much better than it has any right to be. And then as if that wasn't enough, then they're like, oh, hey, on Friday, they're like, without telling anybody, there was no indication this was coming. They just threw it up on their band ca- camp page originally. It was just like, boom, here's a new album called Someday. And this album is really a great entry point for somebody who has always liked Fucked Up's music, but maybe didn't care for the vocals so much because they brought in a lot of guest vocalists. And um, Mikey Halicek, uh, the guitarist, also sang a lot of the lead vocals. He wrote almost all of the lyrics on it. Um, and so it's a much more accessible sounding album um uh, compared to their others. I'm I'm just did you even get a chance to even give this one no. a listen yet? Yeah. No, but this is it's interesting to me because it's one of the things that you and I have talked about where in this day and age bands need to be the the release schedule can't be the way it was for Rage Against the Machine and Tool back in the 90s and you've got to yeah. release stuff. But then again, to be prolific enough to do three full records in one year. We've talked about this with cloud nothings too, with his single of the month. And um, at at a certain point, there is such a thing as being too prolific. And I remember back, back in the old days, uh, uh, Ryan Adams was like that too, where on his website, he, he would have 50, 60, 70 songs that he was working on just posted and and on the one hand it's really admirable and interesting but on the other it's just unmanageable as a fan like at a certain point i need that organization i need things to be boiled down and packaged in a way that i can i can they're bite-sized and i can chew them up and digest them i think like uh you know king gizzard is another uh another one that like just is almost too prolific, but like they're they're almost putting out too many albums to even like catch up on. And it's hard, especially if you could get to them later in their career, then all of a sudden you've got like this crazy run of albums that you're supposed to catch up on Uh, guided by voices. Like that's probably damn near the most famous one who would just put out as many albums as they could in a year year after year after year after year and you do sort of start to lose a little bit of an identity from album to album like you don't have they all sort of start to feel of one kind and so that's that's what's interesting to me is like i'm a little bit concerned that that could be happening to some degree with uh some of these fucked up albums um you know they're all great like i i don't remember where one day ended up in my list last year but i'm pretty sure it was in my top 10 another day was gonna finish very high this year and now i've got you know the who's got the time and a half someday like i feel like i was just still like trying to totally come to terms with another day as like their last out al- like proper album and now i've got this album that i need to digest as well i've started making like just a playlist where i put all the quote unquote day albums together in one playlist and just treat yeah. it like one mega album almost as like a way to try to get through it but like you know i mean fucked up also does they're famous for doing their chinese zodiac series so they do a bunch of uh one-off singles for each of the Chinese Zodiac, Year of the Ox, Year of the Tiger, Year of the Dragon, on and on and on. And so it it can be daunting to like, so for me to try to tell somebody like, hey, you know, I hear you talk about these guys, like, how, what's, where should I start? And it's like, (laughs) God, I don't know. Uh, Because like, I, I mean, I could say they're the chemistry of common life, which was their like really their breakthrough album. And it won them a lot of awards. Uh, I think that's a great starting point. If you just want like 
just this really great album to hear what they were doing when they were at their metic- most meticulous. Like this, it, there is nothing that sounds like that album. Just listen to it with headphones and just listen to the how many different guitar parts are being played on every song. It is mind blowing. Um, and then, well, okay, so you can do that. Well, or maybe it should be David Comes to Life, their rock opera that they made, you know, uh, which even came with an accompanying album of songs that they wrote as other bands that existed in this fictional town that uh, David Comes to Life was supposed to be about. Uh, You know, so you could do that. Or I would say, well, maybe it's one day to hear what they sound like at their most focused, you know, so I. I don't know, like, it, or, or some of their best music is on the Chinese Zodiac one. So maybe start listening to some of those, like, you well, know. On, but on top of all this and, and not, you know, statistics and popularity don't determine art quality for you and me. We're sure. talking about a band with 45,000 monthly listeners on Spotify. Like, they're just right. tiny, tiny, tiny. For sure. Um, well, and their band name alone made sure that they were never like going to. Ben Quad has 211,000 monthly listeners. Yeah. Yeah, because that, that they, makes... play a, they play a, a, a form of music that people can like comprehend a little bit easier. Sure. Like, uh, Fucked Up is a band for music geeks. Like, they just are. Like, you, yeah. you have to really be a, a pretty big music geek, uh, I think, to really go deep on them. But uh, I, I, just did, I just wanted to talk about them a little bit because I think it's... Oh, and I'm it's, not it's trying remarkable. to talk you out of it, it's, by the way. It's remarkable what they're doing. Like, it's that these 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 day series albums one day another day someday are three of their best albums at bar none like no yeah. equivocation they are some of their best like it makes no sense that a band this late in their career who had talked about almost breaking up not that long ago damien damien had talked about the fact that he's like i don't really know like if there's anything left for us to do. Like I, he kind of was talking like this could really be the end. That was before they started doing this series. And now they're more prolific than they've ever been. They're putting out more music at a clip. That's just insane. Um, And so I, you know, I think it's worth talking about. And like, again, if you're a, a huge music dork, like I am and like, you know, Give, give them a listen and see you, you know, you might find some things yeah. you like in them, but um, I, it's, it's definitely one of my personal favorite bands, but it's a very esoteric pick. So it's always hard when we talk about them on this podcast, because I recognize that not everybody is going to be into it, particularly with the vocals. Like the, vo- I like Damien's vocals a lot, but they are definitely an acquired taste and not, not something that's for everybody. So, yeah. And, uh, and again, I wasn't trying to talk you out of talking about yeah. them, but it's just so funny sometimes how you and I will over index on something that's just, and, and maybe yeah. I think that's part of why people listen to us as well is because we are, uh, covering niches to some degree. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that band, that band's a niche on a niche on a niche, <laughs> uh, in a lot of ways, uh, but that's that's what I, I don't that's the the greatest part about being a music fan in this time is having that access uh for all this stuff and in another era there's no way this band has a year like 2024 they, you couldn't do this yeah. in 2012 you couldn't right. do this in 2010 this yeah. is very of the moment and it's yeah. nice to have a band that's thinking differently and thinking in the moment even yep. if sometimes it makes uh, somebody like myself a little bit uncomfortable because yeah. the the way records were recorded and released in album form in 1999 is forever how I want them done. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. I just, yeah. And that's, I think it's a combination of the, the format being there for them to do this. Uh, but it's also, I think a tribute to, to just a, uh, totally insane creativity peak of creativity that a band that that was notorious for how intricate there they were to like be able to just throw all that aside and become creative in this totally different way to become creative and how prolific they could be it's just really something it's just something to see like there's just they deserve a lot of respect for for doing this and for pulling it off as well as they have so yeah i think Uh, that's really cool 
I feel like I've been dominating this episode. So, like, is there any albums that uh, that that you wanted to talk about? No, I think we... it's perfect for you to drive, and I'll react on this one because I, I assume you want to at least talk a. Li- I, I think we should talk a little bit about uh, the Wild Pink record too. But that's your. That's another one of your selections, which is cool, man. Some episodes yeah. are going to be yours. I th- I think there's a chance at some point down the road I may want to go a little bit deeper on chat pile so maybe we won't talk about that here today i'm not ready Um, i want to talk about that one and i'm not ready to talk about that one all right perfect so we can we we, we'll we'll hold off on that one so let's let's get into the wild pink album then um so first of all where did we hear about this one was this an indie cast thing no no not for me it wasn't so i i listened to and gosh i i need to get better about having this stuff like queued up on my screen so i can because i'm trying to remember now what the name of their album was that came out in uh like 2021 um, this is what i'm good at yeah. i will i will always be the the look up I, man i can't believe i'm drawing a blank on this because i a listen billion to this little album, lights. So, a, a billion little lights so that was the one that put them on my radar um i loved that album and i just listened to that one a ton and then it was one of those things where like I was like really deep on that album. And then I kind of forgot about wild pink for a while. And then all of a sudden they put out so their what new kind album. of band are they? Uh, sort of an Americana. Rock I was going to say Americana style. indie. Yeah. Americana indie is probably a good way to put it. Um, they certainly have moments where they can, can and do rock very hard. Um, there's some really fantastic guitar solos and all that, but like, at their core, like they are sort of this Americana indie sound. Um, I, I know they're from New York and you might think they're from Philly because they have sort of a Philly sound to them. And that might just be because they, to me, they remind me a little bit of the war on drugs. Um, I told Craig <laughs> tongue in cheek. I said, I said, they remind me of the war on drugs. If the war on drugs were, weren't, weren't boring, um, which I know that's shots fired. I'm going to piss off a lot of people with that. I, I, I like the war on drugs. I listen to the war on drugs. I, you know, I have no problem with them, but I do get sort of, I don't know if bored is the right word, but I sort of just get tired of them a little bit quicker than I do uh, maybe with wild pink. Um, But well, and it was really funny because when you said that, and then I was checking out the record all I'm doing, I put me in a defensive stance and all of a sudden (laughs) I'm like, but I I like the war on drugs. And so now I'm, I'm thinking poorly about wild pink while I'm listening to this record. No, but honestly, um, it was, it was definitely a lot of, a lot of mid, uh, mid tempo, mid emotion. Yes. Um, it really didn't catch me except a couple of times. Uh, it, you know, it sounds great. It's produced great. Um, but I, I didn't catch a lot of standout songs that'll probably have me coming back a lot. I'm guessing this is a phenomenal live band. Oh, I bet they're amazing live has to be. Um, I, I feel a little bit stronger about this album than Craig does. Um, I, I actually do think I, I've got a decent number of songs on it, on my fate, on my, uh, added to my like songs list. Like there's stuff on here. Like I can see myself listening to this album for quite a while. And this one's sticking with me a little bit. Um, I don't think I've said the album title. It's dulling the horns. Um, it, it was one that I actually didn't know was coming out. I had not heard anything pre-release on this. And then all of a sudden it showed up in my Spotify release radar one day. And I was like, Oh, there's a new wild pink album, you know? And so I listened to it and certainly the indie cast guys also, I gave it a pretty solid review too. I think they're pretty, uh, pretty yeah. in on this. Um, it's, but it's one that because it came out, like we, we did an entire episode on foxing. We did pretty much an entire episode, not a, quite an entire episode on drug church. Like we did this at a time that I was, had these like albums that are going to finish like in my clear top three or four of the year. And so I think the wild pink one did start to fall through the cracks for me a little bit. Like I didn't immediately grab onto this, but just over the last like week, week or so, uh, I just started listening to this a lot more, really listened to it almost on repeat, uh, over the weekend and into this week. And, uh, yeah, it's, you know, I don't have a, a lot to say about it. Just that I just think that these are just really well-crafted songs. And to me, it's just a really enjoyable album to listen to. All right. So what if we touch a little bit? Uh, oh, I can't believe I just did that. 
Um, what if we talk a little bit about Touche Amore? Touche, uh, touch Amore. Touche Amore. Touche Amore. <laughs> Touche Amore. Which I don't know. actually know if that's the proper pronunciation. I, I don't either. Uh, we'll go with Touche Amore. I mean, I think I think that's the way it's spelled. I th- yeah. Right? It, it's, got, it's got an E at the end of both of them. So, I mean... This this band, I don't know how I would describe them either. Like their 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 vocalist is pretty unique. It definitely screamy, yeah. but it's kind of like a shout sing scream. Like he's definitely they, hitting notes of some sort the way he's screaming. They remind um, me a lot of Senses Fail in that okay. way. Like that's kind of the vibe I've I've always gotten from them. It's kind of a Senses Fail kind of thing where it is screaming, but it's like a more melodic screaming. Like there, there, there's melody to, to the, to the, to the vocals. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's interesting because I, it's, so there are new records called spiral in a straight line. It came out October 11th and I really, really like it. It's not really pushing any new ground. It's just a, another really good touche more record. And yeah, I've seen I, this band live. They're really great to see live. I think the the vocals and the way the band comes off live might even be better than the than they come off on record. And I love their records. Yeah, I, this is a band that I've always liked and on the border of loved. Like mm-hmm. I, they have never put out anything even close to bad. No, nothing no. even close to mediocre. However, they do. They are a band that knows what they do and they do that thing they do really well. And they don't do much else other than that thing they do. Right. Like I, I, I think I joked with you. I, before I even listened to this album, I had a feeling what it was going to sound like. And like, it sounds like a touche more album. Like that, that's what they do. This album is what they do. Um, and I don't, think that's a bad thing like i'm not particularly critical. No. like every band has a time and a place like there are bands i love bands that we we sort of talked about this with jerry cantrell last week you know they that with i want blood being sort of just in the zone of what jerry cantrell does it's very much a jerry cantrell alice in chains album and like this is in that same way like touche amore like is a touche amore a- album but yeah, I don't need every band to reinvent the wheel every time. Like if that's not your vibe, if that's not their vibe and that's not their thing, I think there's something to be said for being able to do the thing, one thing that do this thing that you do really well and just keep doing it. I think there's artistic value in that as well. Like it's harder to do than people might think. Um, you know, some, sometimes I always joke that like some bands who try to make a big leap and do things is because they couldn't figure out how to do what they had previously done so as a result they try to make a big leap and fail at it so i don't want to sound critical in any way about this i love this album it's awesome like there's not a bad song on it you just put that on beginning to end and just let it go but that's how all their albums are right but but you do sort of run into this thing where like i don't know where i would rank this Amongst other touche more albums like i always run into this thing with them like i don't know how to rank them because they're all kind of doing the same thing. Yeah. At the same time though, I, I still feel like their records hold together as pieces as records. And I think that's part of why I like them so much is because when I listen to one record, it makes sense that this song follows that one, follows that one, follows that one. Um, it, they're not a lot. I don't feel like there are a lot of non sequiturs, on on this band's records and they're they're a band who seems to want to make full records and they do it and um but i think it's it's interesting especially after we talked about fucked up and the how prolific they are and the cadence of their releases you know this this band has two three years in between records and yeah. i think that probably makes a lot of sense for the style of music that they play and the breadth of the albums that they put out because like this one 
it's only 32 minutes long, but it's 11 yeah. songs. But they feel it's like a- an event when when a new Touche Mori album comes out. Like it's an event. You almost tie their albums. Maybe that's how you differentiate them. It's because like you can sort of like tie them to where you were at in life when you heard those the previous albums. So they're almost like a uh, soundtrack to your life as you go along and you change. And Whereas if they were putting out an album every year, you wouldn't have that same distance between them to like reflect on it yeah where they're they're like uh novelists where fucked up or musical bloggers yes that's exactly right i like that <laughs> so, well i think that's probably um, where we should leave it unless you yeah, got we, something else i do have one more thing i think we should talk about but that's probably the end right. of the, our little running review catching up on some albums that we haven't talked about yet and a few things but i do want to talk about ithaca coming to an end i think oh it's, yeah I, I, I think we need to talk so about let me this. let me let me start with this so ithaca is this meteor band for andrew and me it's a uh, i would call them maybe even death metal uh yeah, close to I, close to close some to kind of metal I mean, they're out it's of metal out of, they are, they're, that's a metal band they're out of england the the singer screamer is female and they put out one of the best records of the last five years they put out one of my absolute favorite records of the last five maybe even 10 years um and you and I were kind of consistently here and there playing a game like, Hey, when, when's the next, when's the next Ithaca record coming out? What do you think it's going to sound like? Cause the last one was such a huge step forward s- sonically and production wise from anything that they ever done before. It was called yep. they fear us. It came out in 2022 and uh, that was my first exposure to the band. And then I went back and with, listened to the language of injury and trespassers or not trespassers. That was a single. I'm anyway, I went back uh, and listened to the previous stuff. I think that was an EP, wasn't it? I think it was an EP. I, I yeah. think it was an EP. Um, but either way, I started at the, the 2022 record and then I went back and I was like, Oh wow. Yeah. And it made me appreciate they fear us even more. Um, yeah. but they're done. They're done. <laughs> Yeah, uh, and, you know, this was an interesting band, like, very heavy subject matter uh, on, on these, you know, oh, yeah. the, the language it's of not, injury is... not a good is, time. Right. The language of injury is almost exclusively about a abusive relationship and getting out of that, and then they fear us as sort of like the aftermath of that, and uh, sort of talking about, like, coming out an entirely different person, Um Really heavy subject matter, but uh, particularly they they fear us is going to be an album I'm never going to stop listening to. It's never. It is in my pantheon of all time favorite albums. I I still can just put that on whenever I need it, and like just it's like you know like catching up with an old friend. You know, you just fall right back into that place with it. It's the the you know the. The guitar playing is phenomenal on it. Uh, the uh, I love her, the, her vocals on this. Like it's awesome to hear um, a fe- a female like singing these screaming vocals. Um, and then they even have like the closing track is like a straight up pop song on, on that, um, which just comes totally out of left field. It's so good and like it. It's one of the best closing tracks to any album ever, because like that thing just, Oh, every time I listen to that, I'm just immediately ready to like go back and listen to the whole album again. So we, but to your point, like we were, we've, we've talked about it a lot. Like we kept saying like, man, what is Ithaca going to do next? Like, how do they top this? Like, what are, what are they going to do next? And then as a couple of years go by, it's like, man, we got to be getting close to a new album. Don't we? And we found out via an Instagram post uh, over the weekend that there will not be another Ithaca album. They are breaking up. Um, And they sort of talked about, it wasn't a contentious breakup. They said they felt that they're closer than ever. Um, They sort of just didn't feel like they had anything else in them to say creatively. Um, I think they they sort of just felt like they said what needed to be said with those albums. And rather than, you know, 
rather than hanging on for too long and putting out albums that maybe their heart wasn't into that people wouldn't have liked as much, they sort of just said, let's just go out on a high note. And so they're going to play one more show. They're putting out one more song and that's going to be a wrap for Ithaca. It's interesting too, because uh, I can't help but think that the business side of things didn't have some kind of an impact as well, because here you are, you're this, you, you play this kind of music metal that is never going to be not the way they play it anyway. It's never going to be that, that big mainstream right. thing, but you put out a record, this phenomenal and this well revered, this critically acclaimed, and it doesn't, it doesn't do enough to even get you to the American festival circuit. I don't think they ever did make it to America to play these songs. Um, um I think they might have done a couple of American festivals. I I could be wrong, but I yeah, think maybe. I rec- I I think I recall seeing some Instagram stories uh, uh, from them. But I I was I looking could... hard because I very badly wanted to see them perform this yeah. stuff live, and I watched yeah. all the YouTube videos I could find of them performing it and everything else. Yeah. So, um, you know, and and so if if you write a record this good, uh, so good that it might be unfollowable. <laughs> and it only did this much for you from a business standpoint or from yeah. an artistic freedom standpoint, because honestly, success and money does give you the ability to quit your day jobs and do the kinds of things you need to do to be a professional yeah. all time, not all time, full time artist. And I'm just I'm I'm projecting and I'm guessing that that the best some of the best work we, you and I have ever heard didn't didn't mm. enable that. Yeah, and it's sort of like in a similar vein, but similar but different. Uh, you know, you and I have also talked a lot about like when's Turnstile putting out another album, right? Like, especially in the in the world of hardcore, where bands tend to churn out albums. You know, I think Turnstile was probably twenty twenty two as well, uh, maybe even twenty one. Now that I think, it might have been yeah. twenty one. Um, we're going on like it's been a minute since we've had since that uh, Turnstile album glow on, and I sort of worry about that for them from a standpoint of how do you how do you follow up an album like that? But the difference is, whereas they fear us, didn't propel Ithaca from a to like this global thing. Turnstile's album did like Turnstile like legit blew up like that is a big band that plays huge festivals they can play almost any venue now they're they sort of like crossed over into the they got the opening gig with blink 182 yeah that, that, absolutely and uh so you know so they almost have more pressure because it's like they the the industry is waiting for them, you know, and so I'll be curious to see, you know, what what they do. But um, yeah, you know, for for Ithaca, I I respect the decision to just say, you know, we did our thing and we're just going to move on. I I'm I will always be curious to see if you know the members form other bands if they do other things create creatively. Like I certainly would listen to anything that any member of this band does. Uh, but for today, I'm just, I'm just sad. You know, I'm sad that we're losing a band that you and I both uh, really loved quite a bit. So and their farewell show is going to be called cremation party, just like their song <laughs> cremation yep. party. Yep. So good way to go out. Yeah. And with that, uh, we hope the world is treating you well. We hope that this episode, even though we did talk a little bit about politics, was apolitical enough that you got to enjoy <laughs> it. Um, you got a little break from whatever it is you're going through in the world and um, maybe even found some new records to listen to this weekend. So, on a, uh, yeah, we appreciate everything. Please do all the things that help us out. Share the show with a friend. Subscribe to the YouTube um, let somebody know that you heard this, uh, heard, heard a band on this show and that they should also listen to this show because uh, we love doing it and we love doing it for you guys and love hearing feedback from you. So that's it for us. This has been the Album of Record podcast.